like a trusted turnout jacket you've had for years. Flex 7 outer shell fabric delivers a perfectly broken in feel on the very first wear. Flexible, comfortable, and powered with the strength of enforced technology, Flex 7 outer shell fabric is made to move. To learn more, visit tencatafabrics.com slash flex7. Flex 7, powered by enforced technology. Only from Tenkata Protective Fabrics. I've been told by everybody up on this roof that they're all off the roof. I am on the roof of Exposure 4. Got to fire through the roof of the fire building in the entire rear section. Now remember, given the payday, a different account is for, okay? 610B, that was the payday, 610B. I'm out here, we got a fire. One and a half story, single family dwelling, fire shown from the second floor, give me a second alarm on this. See up there, top floor, I got people hanging out the top floor windows with a baby. Commercial building, uh, a lot of fire, a lot of smoke, go ahead and strike a third alarm on my orders on this. Got people on the front fire escape here with windows sunken below them, we need somebody up there. Yeah, let them know we got a job, I'm pulling up. Second alarm, I got a one-story single-family frame, heavy fire showing from the attic. So we use it all here, we got one line stretch, fire on the fourth floor, second line being stretched, primary switches are underway. Hey, welcome back to our Fire Engineering Podcast, The Command Post. I'm Chief Rick Lasky, along with my best buddy and teacher partner, uh, Chief John Salka. And um, John, um, <laughs> we... You know, usually we start these shows off with either we'll do a little quick FDIC update in a second, but how cool is this? Uh, good friend of yours, good friend of all of ours, um, uh, great great friend of the fire service, um, Chief Bobby Morris, um, Rescue One Captain when he retired. I think he started in the FDY like in 1973. He's been with the Stanford, Connecticut Fire Department for a while, for a long, you know, I think, you know, uh, since he got there. out, since he retired from the FDNY, right? Yeah, I think he, I think somewhere he, he was either started near there and then went to the FDNY in New York City, and then when he retired, he went back and uh, was assistant chief there for years. Uh, I think since like 2013. I'm not I maybe mix up my dates here, so forgive me, Bobby. But uh, Billy just posted it. Um, they just they just made him the chief. He was interim chief or acting chief for three months. They just made him the chief of Stanford, Connecticut. John, how cool is that? Congratulations. Great guy for a great job. Yep. Well, and and like I said, 50 years in the fire service and he's far from being done. Uh, what, a, what a great guy. Uh, uh, incredible, incredible instructor. He's always, I mean, the guy with, from fourth century to everything else he does with the rescue. So it's just nice to see another good guy, another good chief. How about that? Another good fire chief. Absolutely. So. Good man. Good man. And then we are all set. We just posted it for FDIC along with everybody else. Congratulations to all those that are uh, that got accepted. And and John, I always mention this. Um, we're out and about. We're going to talk about it a little bit later about. Uh, tr- don't get frustrated when you. Let's talk FDIC. When you when you submit a a, a class, um, there's a variety of reasons. Sometimes why it may not get approved. One is there's only John. There's only so many classrooms there. There's only. There's more. There's a ton more submissions than there's available space to teach, right? And then, you know, you and I've said for for years, if you're going to submit a program, number one, be be very familiar with it, be comfortable with it, you know, know your topic backwards and forwards because you're at uh, the biggest conference anywhere. Um, and if you're going to try and BS someone, you're going to test it. But know your stuff, know your content. Um, and the other thing too is, you know, find a topic. Um, that's kind of your niche, you know, and John, I always use the example. There was one guy that was upset because he wanted to do store fires, you know, and he says, well, I got rejected for store fires two years in a row. I go, well, that's because Chief John Norman does store fires. He goes, yeah, I know. I go, but but Chief John Norman does store fires. Yeah, I understand. I go, so, you know, they can't tell John Norman who, like you, you know, legendary FDNY, you know, fire service member, period. Hey, John, uh, we're going to have you take a year or two off, you know, from teaching store fires, which among all his topics are great. But so, so, you know, you and I've told people for the longest time, you know, to, um, you know, to, to pick a topic that, you know, I always tell me it's like, re- it's like do, submitting articles. If you're going to submit an article, read the magazine, because sometimes John, people send an article to me and look, I'll go, well, you know, they just published that like three months ago, four months ago. They're not going to do another one three months later. You know, kind of read the magazine, go to classes, but don't give up. Don't give up. There's, you know, so many of us, you know, we, we put in, we put in. John, you and I know some pretty heavy hitters 
that for one reason or another, you know, didn't make it. And then the following year they do and so on and so forth. I can't imagine what Chief David Rhodes and Diane Rothschild, what they how <laughs> what they go through after the advisory board submits all their evaluations, what they have to go through to pick the classes within all the different, you know, topics, you know, from from tax to strategy, leadership to safety and all that. So, I mean, what, what, what advice do you have? You know, in class, a lot of people come up to you and ask you how to how to get an article published, how to teach it at FDIC. What do you usually tell these guys and gals when they come up to you and ask you that? You know, we just talked about it this past weekend because we, we were out of town. We were down in Virginia doing a company officer academy. And, and I had that exact conversation with a couple of, a couple of guys, not young guys, a couple, couple of guys that were officers, a captain and a battalion chief were both interested in presenting and, and you know, had written, written a few things. And, and the, one, the one guy that had a great, I thought was a really fantastic idea for a program, for a presentation. I said, have you written anything on this? Is there an article that exists on this program yet? Or have you written, you know, either for fire engineering or anywhere else for that matter? He said, no, no, no. I just put this together. I've done it. I've done it about four or five times at different conferences here in North Carolina. You know, I said, well, here's my advice to you. If you're looking to go to FDIC, go go to them first with an article. I said, put this thing to paper. Number one, it'll be sort of like a review or an update. You, you'll be doing a program that you've already done. You're already doing out in the field, right? Write a nice article. Write a nice professional article with the same title and submit it to Fire Engineering. Now, now your advice about hopefully they didn't just publish one, but if you have a particular article on a particular program that you want to do, go ahead and do it. If they did one last month, you know they're, they're just going to file it. They're not going to throw it away. And maybe six months later, let's say, hey, you know what? We, we got another one of them in, in the hopper here. Let's grab that one and post it. So my point to this fellow was, this chief was, get yourself published at least once, but a couple of times, start writing and, and then getting selected as a presenter at FDIC is sort of like the natural progression. It's sort of like, it's sort of like the promotion from, from being a writer, you know, it's not absolute. It's not, abs- you know, uh, you know, every time, but that's certainly the route to go. And most people that are presenting at FDIC and elsewhere, even the other shows, if you're writing first, your name gets out there, people start to recognize it. Somebody says, Oh, you know what? I think this guy wrote an article. And suddenly they are, you're writing and you're teaching and, and, and you're off and running. That, that's pretty simple advice, you know? Well, and, and um, one of the guys we talked to actually was our, well, the host, we had Danville, Virginia. What a great place, huh? What a great fire department. And another one, we're so lucky. You, you say it, I always steal your thunder with this when I'm in classes and when we're doing a show that you, you, you said it hundreds of times, you know, we have the honor to hang with the coolest people in the world. We get to go out and, you know, talk shop all day long in the classroom and, and all that. And uh, here we are in Danville, Danville, uh, Virginia. And uh, uh, one of the guys that we hooked up with that, that coordinated everything was Deputy Chief Brendan uh, Smith. Um, and uh, another, you know, again, um, uh, came up and talked to you about stuff and talk, just what, you know, hearts in it, heart, hearts in it. You can tell very passionate, you know, both of us love guys with passion, but you're right. And, you know, sometimes it's like the FDIC class, the same thing, the articles, Someone may have wrote something about Venon and Search that all right, they just published, but there might be a little different twist on it. You know, there's always, you know, there, we always say that there's nothing new in the fire service, right? But there might be like a new little, you're reading it going, and all of a sudden, boop, they hit you with something. I go back right. to you in Wichita. You've been dealing with ladders for 50 years in a fire service. And you go, oh my God, look what they did to their ladders in Wichita, Kansas on their, their ladder companies. And it, it, there's always new stuff. So, I mean, you know, you could have done a whole ladder article and all of a sudden bink, that thing comes up and it makes the whole article worthwhile to read. Right. So, and, you know. and the point about writing is so simple because um, you, you simply can't get published if you don't write and submit it. Submit it. Get it in there. Let, let them take a look at it. Listen, they may not even like it. You may, you may hear back from, you know, from Diane or, or maybe from you, Rick. You know what? It's a little short. It's a little long. It's it's repetitive. You know, can you work on it a little bit more? They don't throw it away and say, you know, don't come back here. Go to another magazine. Right. They, they'll work with you. So the, the, the bottom line is if you're interested in writing, number one, start writing. Number two, submit it. Get it in there and start the process. And before you know it, I mean, you and I occasionally, occasionally I can't talk for you. Occasionally I write an article while I'm waiting for a plane to take off. I'm sitting, I'm sitting, you know, I'm, I'm sitting <laughs> in the airport and an idea comes to my mind, or maybe an idea came to my mind the night before at a presentation. I'm sitting there and the plane is delayed. I'm like, you know what? Let me let me pull that computer out while while I got this on my mind. You're the and only guy I know that out. can write an article. You're the only guy I know that can write an article while you're shaving. You know, you're like, yeah. you know, I was shaving this morning and I wrote an article. I mean, you- <laughs> 
I have thought about stuff while I was shaving, but I never wrote one. No. <laughs> but but you but, but you're right. And so, you know, I always tell people because you know, as an editorial advisor for for David and for Diane, you know, my you know, one of the jobs you do it as well is to find the new authors and to find the the, the next all-star, you know. Um uh, you know, the, the next person. And, you know, a lot of times, John, I'll help people like I'll go, first of all, you go to work. If you listen to the show, you're already at fireengineering.com or you're on YouTube, but go to fire, fireengineering.com. They have a whole link you can click on. It tells you what they're looking for in an article, like how many words about photos, graph charts, <laughs> blah, blah, blah. But I tell people, John, that, you know, you're looking for a thousand to 1500 words and let them cut it. You know, don't write something short let them edit it down if they have to or turn it into right. a two-part article. Right. And you know what? The best advice I got from Diane uh, Rothschild back in 1995, you've been writing longer than me, John, where she told me, she goes, we need you to tell a story. We have English majors that sit here and edit your articles. You know, because sometimes guys will send me articles, John, they already have them like in columns, like they're already, like they're publishing a magazine. And it's like, no, double space, 12 point, Times New Roman, you know, bold this, don't do that, blah, blah. Make it simple for the editors to read. But she said it best, John. She says, she said, you know, we have English majors that will make make it all come together. You just tell your story and write for the whole fire service, not just the FDY Chicago or or Lewis will write for the whole fire service because there is a ton of stuff. And, right. and, and and we're going to talk about some of this in a little bit, but you were so right with, if, you, if you've got the itch, do it. Just remember intro, body, conclusion in your instructor one class. In your introduction, you hook them with your whole thing, give them the body, then hook them again at the end. Because I'll read articles, John, and I'll go, and then it just stops. And I'm like, where's the ending? Where's the summarization? You made a great point this, but you kind of, you left this thing hanging out there. So simple, simple thing I always tell people, intro, body, conclusion, you know, bring it home at the end. Slam dunk it. Get some good. There's plenty of photos. Make sure you get permission. You'll have forms you do. But man, oh man, we're staying. I mean, especially now, you can end up in the magazine, fire engine magazine. You can end up in in gems if it's an EMSR. You can end up fire apparatus if it's about a station tool or, or an engine or whatever. You can end up on fire engine, fireengine.com, firefighter nation. They have so many ways for you to get published, and there's a ton <laughs> of people reading it. So absolutely, you know, absolutely, take a shot at it. Take a shot. Do so it. please do it. You know, um, submit an article, submit a class. Joe, oh, oh, by the way, one last thing about classes, John, I want to mention to our viewers, you know, keep in mind about, I'm sorry, not about the class, about the articles. Um, right now, it's the middle, it's, it's like the 10th you know, or 20th or whatever it is. I even look at the calendar for our show um, of um, uh, January. So it's, it's, Jan it's January, 8th, January 18th. Okay. Right now, the middle of January, they were they already just put to bed the magazine for next month. They're almost done with the following month, and they're starting the third month. So, there you know this. You've been in the in the in the, the magazine industry for a long time as an author. They're always about three months out. So, I had one guy did a safety article. It was a great article. He got published, John. But he was like, "It's been like six months." I go, "I know," but you know, like and real quick, folks, you'll see it at, on the website. They have themes like January is protection and prevention. You know, now they'll publish all kinds of things in there, but there's different features. February's apparatus, March's truck company operations, blah, blah, blah. So, you know, if you go there and you look, understand this, that, you know, it, it may take a few months to get it there. But, man, just send it to Diane. Um, let them look at it and, and let them pick it apart. And one more last thing, John, for our, for our viewers, FDIC. Um, so, so if you're going to FDIC to International and Indy, if you're going to be there on Monday or Tuesday, John and I will be teaching our workshop on Monday afternoon from 1.30 to 5.30. Four hours. Yep. Four hours. You asked for it. You, John, every year people are coming up going, oh, when are you guys going to do your five alarm leadership program again? What, you know, that we did, golly, back in the 90s, you know, back in the, the early 2000s, you know, you know, when you, it's, it's out of our book, you know, our best selling book, Five Alarm Leadership from the Firehouse of Fire. When are you can do Five Alarm Leadership, Real Leadership, Real People, you know, because you and I are always adding stuff to the program and moving things around. The eight essential elements. Right. And, and leadership, there. and leadership doesn't go out of style. It gets more important every day. Yeah. Right. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, folks, you, you asked for it. You got it. Chief Rhodes and, and Diane blessed us. Uh, so, come, you know, sign up early because the classroom fills up pretty quick if you've been there. Uh, there's only so many seats in each classroom. So Monday, five alarm leadership with with myself and Chief Salka, one thirty to five thirty, and then uh, Wednesday, right after opening ceremonies, 
Uh, we're going to be doing our program, the three degrees of Mayday. You asked for that again. The three degrees of Mayday from 1030 to 1215, 1030 to 1215. And then the rest of the week, we're in the booth signing books. We'll go by our, we'll go visit our friends at Dingus Fire with, uh, you know, Nick Dingus and Jeff, Jeff Bryant and go visit with them, the Columbia Southern booth. So come see us at FDIC, but don't wait to sign up for that workshop if you're going, because uh, a couple of past couple of years, we've had people that have been a little disappointed because the they signed up too late and couldn't get in. So, all right, John. So, you and I, like we we we, we proudly boast about, which we don't brag about nothing with us except the fact that we never have a script. <laughs> when we do these, or we do uh, the hump day hangouts, we do or old school. But one of the things you and I talked about before going live is just what you said about Danville, Virginia, about a couple of the guys coming up. You know, Chief Salka, I had him too. Um, you know, everything from. I want to do an article. I want to do this too. I want to teach class too. I had guys coming up and asking firehouse questions. How do you deal with this? You know, I I, I love the job. Um, you know, but the some of the guys I work with don't as much as me. And and um, you and I were kind of. I heard you say it a couple times. You know, uh, as a firefighter, you know, are, are you are you into the job? You know, are, are you into you know? And and how did you get that way? And let's talk about passion and either the, the the motivation killers or the motivation builders. You and I talk, you talk about Pete Lund, I talk about Bill Allen in class. You couldn't work for my Lieutenant Bill Allen and not be a crazy nut job maniac about the fire service. There's no way. You you either had big time problems if you worked for Bill and you weren't fired up about that. That's like being around Tommy Trevino and Jack McCass and <laughs> Eddie Enright, like Tom Freeman. Oh my God. If you're around those guys, you know, you couldn't help but love the job. So, how about we talk about that today, about, you know, firefighters that are into the job and, and, and how, how into the job are you, right? Right. And actually, you know, I know when we talked about this yesterday, when we were sort of bopping around looking for a topic, thinking about what we're going to say, um, you know, one of the old sayings is now that you're on the job, get into the job. And the other saying, you've already said that, you know, you know, be, being into the job is everything. And, and, and yesterday we said, but what does that really mean? You know, some guys say, oh, I'm into the job. You know what I'm saying? That's like saying, I love the fire service. That's like saying a lot of things. Some people say yeah, stuff, and I'm not saying, so. right, they're not insincere. They're not lying. But you you still find grades, you know, these different grades of people. Like some guys are into the job, and they always show up a little bit early, and they show, you know, are we are going to drill tonight, Lieutenant? Yeah. But then other guys are like, they, they come in the firehouse, and they're dragging in a door and a door frame that they picked up down the block that was out for garbage. He said, look, we can set this up and, and make a forced entry door out of this thing. You know what I'm saying? Like there are degrees of being into the job. And obviously, obviously the more you're into the job, the more true that is number one. And not only the more true it is, but the more you rub off on the guys around you, it's very hard. We talked about, we, we just talked about Bobby, you know, making chief up there in Connecticut and, uh, you know, when he was a captain of rescue one, they were going out at midnight when it was snowing, when it was two degrees. Midnight, snowing, two degrees. They were driving out the door. Talk about that. Talk about – you tell that story in class about him coming in, at what, at midnight? <laughs> with rescue? Right. And the details may not be exactly right, but the story is always true. And this is a true story. So it's so it's rescue one. And I've always heard it was Bobby, Bobby Morris, and it makes perfect sense because the guy is an absolute lunatic he, for the job. He loves the job, right? So they would say you'd be hanging around. Well, first of all, in the FDNY, nobody, nobody's tucked in with, with a with a you know a lollipop at midnight in, in a bunk room. Everybody's up in the kitchen. Everybody's still got their bucket pants on at midnight in the winter time. Everybody's walking around. And, but anyway, so rescue one. The guys are all still there. Single quarters, single single company, six people, and all of a sudden, bing, 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 rescue's going out. You know, they all look at the clock whether they're watching TV, sitting in the, sitting in the kitchen drinking coffee, and out they go, and and there they go. You know, driving down the block, snowing. Like I said, 10 degrees outside, dark, middle of the night. And they get to this vacant building that, that the captain has the key for. Apparently, he stopped there during the day, talked to the guys that were working or talked to the owner. Said, can we get in here? We won't do any damage. I just want to bring the guys in here later. Sure. So there he is opening the lock, telling the guys, okay, let's get the life-saving rope and, and your regular tools. Let's go up to the roof. Up to the roof they go. Now the roof's got several inches of snow. The wind is blowing. It's cold, as I said. And he's like, okay, let's do a life-saving rope rescue. Let's look down this shaft, an enclosed shaft. A, a shaft that's got four walls around it between the two buildings that it, that it shares, right? There's a woman trapped down there. Puts his flashlight down and shows down. There's a woman there. There's smoke coming out over her head. We got to get to her. Let's do it right now, guys. Let's do the life-saving rope rescue. Boop. They dump it. They start tying it. Also, he's like, hold on, hold on, hold on. 
Turn the flashlights off, guys. There's too much smoke up here. There's so much smoke. There's flashlights aren't even illuminating anything. Just turn your lights off and let, let's do it, you know, with, with the visibility that we have. And off they go. You know, these are five rescue guys. These are guys that were FDNY, engine men, truck men, busy companies, made it, you know, came to the rescue. They have a lot of experience. They got a lot of training. And there they are, bing, bang, boom, and they did it so quickly. Obviously, he doesn't let them actually go over the edge, but right there is where he stops it. Okay, good. Perfect job. And he's watching, and he's looking at his clock saying, that was an, that was an excellent time, you know, because they do it quickly. Why? Because this is what they do. Because they go out at midnight 10 times during the winter and, and, and do it in the dark. And because in the middle of the summer when it's 95 degrees out, and everybody's saying, ah, can we stay in for drill tonight, Cap? You know, it's pretty hot outside. That's when they're up on the roof somewhere sweating at, at, at 8 p.m. and it's still light out and they're trying to do something else. You know, I remember telling my guys. Now, I, I, was, I was in the rescue as a firefighter years ago, but I remember telling my guys when, when I was a captain of 48 engine, you know, truck guys in the firehouse, engine guys in the firehouse, and may, maybe somewhere there'll be a life-saving rope rescue. We call it a roof rope. It's the old term, but we still use it. Um, and I would say, you guys in 56 truck, you guys in, in, in 58 truck, you better have this stuff down cold. Because I'll tell you what, right now, if there's any talk on the radio, on a handy talkie, any talk at all, we may have to do a life-saving rope rescue. If that's even said or uttered, I said, if you're not already up there and ready to work, rescue will get there or the squad or a special unit, not because they're better than you, but because they practice this all the time. They will arrive there after you, and they'll get over the edge ahead of you, and they will make the rescue. And, and it's not about who gets to make the rescue. It's about getting there as fast as possible, and they'll beat you. And they'll beat you. And you'll be ready, and you'll be, okay, I got it, three clicks, and all of a sudden, boop, they're over the edge. And you're like, what What happened here? You know, so for a couple of reasons, the main one being we want to make the rescue successful. We want to, you know, get those people that are in need out of the building. But uh, I just love the story because there's so many lessons. The first lesson is about the officer that wants to train his firefighters in real conditions. Talk about, talk about the best person in the world to be really into the job is the boss. The guy and the gal riding the front seat, if they're into the job, how could everybody else not be? I mean, I remember, right. I remember being officer in squad one and guys were there, you know, Kevin O'Rourke and, and Joe Downey and, 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 you know, I, I could just, Freddie LaFamina, all these young men were into the job. They all wanted to be teams. Huh? John, John Cullen. Cullen. John Cullen. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, a couple of, we lost a couple on 9 11, but uh, Billy McGinn and, and, and that. But I'll tell you what, being into the job, you know, I, I remember one time some guy, I forget who it was. It was a friendly joke, but he was like, man, hey, Cap, you are some buff, you know? I said, you know what? <laughs> Coming from you, I'll take that as a compliment. That's a compliment. You know That's right. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> well, and, and I'll, let me say this real quick before I bring something else up. So if Chief, if Chief Bobby Morris is watching this show for some reason, if he's having a hard time sleeping at night or whatever – John and I want to work for you, Chief. John already said it. We both want to come That's work right. for you in Stanford. Now that you're the chief chief of Stanford, we I don't care whether it's just sweeping the floors or whatever. We can drive there. I'm not that far. I'm not that far. Yeah, I'll fly back and forth every day on American Airlines. I, I want to work for Chief Bobby Morris. But you said something I want to go back to for a second, which is so right on, so spot on. About And I say it all the time. You know, I, I teach the program Pride and Ownership, the Love for the Job, you know, uh, there, are, there are different levels of love for the job. And I, I had a hard time when I was younger, John, um, putting up with, like, I, I just, I couldn't understand how guys, when I was a young firefighter, I couldn't, they, uh, they just weren't, they didn't, how could you not love this job? How could you not, how could it just be a paycheck? How could it just be, oh my God, this is the coolest thing in the world. And one of my mentors, Chief Jack McCasson said, Ricky, you know, not everybody's the same. Everybody has different levels. Some people have different things going on in their lives that are affecting their passion at the moment. They they all still they all still love what they do, but some are, are thirty something years into the job and they're into the job, but they're not into it when they like they were when they were twenty one years old and all that stuff. And and so it took me a while, John, to realize there were like you said it before. There's different levels. And I used to tell guys, look, I don't expect you to love the job like me. But I expect I expect you to have your own passion for the job. Um, what, what's Jerry Wells say? Um, uh, um, uh, be you know, here whole, now. Be here now. Be here now. And, and real quick for our viewers, we've mentioned this a bunch of times before. Jerry Wells, a retired battalion chief from Louisville, Texas. Dad was a legendary, great battalion chief, great leader from Dallas Fire. Um, 
he 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 took a program from Boise State when they upset OU in football years ago in college. He took the the, the college coaches, the Boise State's coaches leadership theme for that year of uh, be here now and add it to the fire service. You know, and and the, the coach said something along the lines, John, like, you know, look, when you're here, I need you to be here now. When you're here, be here now. Engage. When you go back to your dorm, your resume is everything, go back, play Xbox, what are you gonna do? Actually give Xbox hundred percent too, but go back, that's fine. When you're here, be here now. And he did such a great job with that, John. You and I have talked about this before. Once in a while on social media, you'll see a dry erase board, a chalkboard in a kitchen or in a, in a firehouse on apparatus floor. And diagonally, right, in chalk or in a marker, it says, be here now, X place point, X place point, line, line. And somebody's getting the message like, hey, uh, you need to re-engage. You need to come back on this side. We know that's going on. But, you know, be here now. You, you, we talk about it with our volunteer departments. Uh, you talk about on drill night. You know, I look at my guys. Wichita West is a great volunteer fire department. I brag them all the time. Great leadership. Um, you know, I'm the train officer. I'm honored that that Chief Fetzer, Chief Albert asked me to be their train officer, lieutenant. But, you know, the, the, I say when I'm there and when we're teaching, it's a couple hours on drill night. Put your phone down and focus. You know, let, let's get here, get the rigs checked. Let's get on drill. Let's get on top of it. We only have so much time. And it's nice to visit, but save that for afterwards or get there early enough. But be here now, engage. And and you've heard me say this plenty of times, passion drives success. You and I, we like I said, I don't how many times you said, you know, I've never had a bad class. You know, now for our viewers, if you're ever around Chief Salka, his 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 yardstick, his measuring tool for a great program, you know where I'm going with this. i we call each other. So how's the group? How how where are you at? Oh, I'm I'm in I'm in Amboy. How are oh they're great? How where are you at? Oh, I'm in uh, Beeperville. Really? How are they? Oh, they're great, but they're no Birmingham. So to our viewers, John was in Birmingham, Alabama, and he just was on fire. He called me, this is the greatest group. And we've had some great groups. But so if he compares you, if he says, yeah, they're, they're, where I'm at, they're on, where we were just at in Danville, you know, Danville, Virginia, those guys there and gals, it was like another Birmingham. And when he says that, that's like, I don't know if there's a better compliment. That's like, right, oh, my right. God. You know, he's into it. So, so, so let me ask you this, John. We well, talked about before, before, before we do that. I want to, there was something else I, I wanted to say a moment ago. Um, the other great thing about being into the job and loving it and, and, you know, getting there early and drilling and training and talking shop and, you know, is it's contagious. It's contagious. Yes. You know, sometimes you get a new guy on a shift or a guy transfers in or sometimes he's just a guy. Like an EFD and white, a lot, a lot of firehouses have two companies, an engine and a truck, and there's a bunch of guys working. And, you know, sometimes a guy from the engine will come over and say, wow, that was really cool, that drill that we just had. You know, I mean, the engine and truck will drill together maybe on something. And maybe maybe one of the young engine men will come over to a truck guy or even to the truck boss, probably to a truck fireman, and say, you know what, boy, that was really cool. I'd, I'd like to I'd like to learn a little bit more about, you know, forcible entry and stuff like that. I'm, I've been in the engine for a couple of years, and I'm loving it. I'm loving it. I love this engine. But – uh Gee, maybe that's something I can do down the road. Before you know it, there's a kid that, that there's a spark, you know, something get ignited in him just from a drill in a firehouse, from a great lieutenant like Pete Lund, or maybe from a couple of great firefighters like the guys that we work with. And all of a sudden, you know, Mark Russell Dine or whatever. And all of a sudden, this guy is is hungry. It lights the fuse. And, you know, you, you come back a year later or whatever, and now he's in the truck. All of a sudden, he transfers over. Not not that, that that's any measure of being in the truck or not, because there's plenty of guys in the engine and into the job as well. But the point is, it's contagious. And the, and the more guys and gals, the more people, the more firefighters and officers that are into it, and the higher level of it that they're into, the grade of, of being into the the better it is for the whole house. And before you know it, people around there know it. Oh, man, 45 engine, 58 truck, what a great house. They do a lot of work. They're into the job. The, the firemen help each other and, and, and watch each other and sort of, you know, make sure each other pulling their weight. Great place. And that's what happens when you got good people in a good house, you know. And you hear that, you know, they got great bosses there too, because we've seen that before with great firefighters and the bosses suck or whatever. But when they've got that great thing going on, you know, and an and example I want to throw there too, just what you're saying. So, you know, Jimmy Spears, right? Um, Dr. Spears, a legendary, him and his wife are, they're our vet. The, everybody in North Texas, I think, uses them for their pets. Jimmy is incredible. Um, I, I love him dearly. And, um, I, I, I told you this, I was, I was standing next to two of our younger firefighters on the apron. We just came back from, you know, call and everything else. And we were finished up. We're getting the rig back in service. 
And the two young guys are standing with their hands in their pockets, just kind of staring out towards the street. And and I said, look at the look look over there. I said, isn't that amazing? They go, God, I'm just amazed at that. Aren't you guys kind of awestruck? What? He's he's 50 years old, you know. But he's got well. First of all, he's 50. You would never know. He's got the energy of a 21 year old. He runs everywhere, you know. Um, big fitness, not and everything else. Goes to every single class he can attend anywhere in the country, anywhere he can get it. John, and this is a guy who's a medical you? doctor, right? This is a guy who's a medical doctor, highly trained. Yeah, he's a veterinarian, but you know how, yeah. And and all this stuff, and, and he's he's got a broom and he's sweeping the apron because we had a bunch of mud and rocks from when we came back from this call. And I just said, look at this. We're done putting the rig in service where everybody else is ready to go. Okay, it's time to go. But the, And he's sweeping. And I was I was making a point to the two young guys who were standing with their hands in their pockets going, all right, you're 18, you're, you're 23. And, and this guy is, he's, we're done putting the rig of service. We just got done at a fire and he's sweeping the apron. I'm, I'm just, you know, like you said, there's examples out there. When, when, when they come up to us in class and they go, Chief Salk and Chief Lasky, I'm getting ready to get, you know, <clears throat> I'm, I'm getting ready to go from being a junior to a, a full fledged volunteer. I'm getting hired by my career department. Um, any recommendations for a young firefighter? What, and we just told him in class, what we tell him, you know what? There's a lot of things we could talk about, love for the job, passion, all those things, so on and so forth, just like we're talking about right now. Pick out like the best firefighter on your shift, not the not the jackass, not the buffoon, not the goof, you know, that guy. Pick out the guy or gal who's dialed in, man, the one, you know what I'm saying, and be like them. You and I did a show. We did a, um, a podcast called That Great Company Officer, Be More Like Tim, talking about Tim Clatt, your favorite company officer in the world, off 88 Engine, Lieutenant Tim Clatt. And what do we tell people? That's what we said. You want to be a great company officer? There he is. Be like him. Be like him. You know, be plenty, like him. That's right. There's plenty of examples out there. So, so let me ask you this. You know, so so you're you're one of your sons, Brian, uh, is a firefighter. Okay, now he's been doing this for he's been a firefighter for a lot of years now. You know, he's doing great. Um, pretty cool, dude. I'm just gonna do some bragging. It's snowing. You got snow all over the place, and your son's over at the memorial. You know, shovel in the sidewalks in the walkway at the memorial. The fire. That, that's and, pretty. And you know, I, I quite accidentally saw that. I'm looking through Facebook, and uh, and and last night or yesterday afternoon, I got I got the whole story because I mentioned something to him. I said, "Hey, I saw you on Facebook. I saw you shoveling over at the monument. Pretty cool." He said, "Yeah." He said, "I didn't go over there to shovel to get a picture taken." He said, "I just I just was going over there to shovel because it was deep snow, and you know, we were over there last week and." I said, no, no, no. And then and then Rachel, who's his wife, who's right there, she said, no, I'm the one that posted it. I didn't mean anything. I didn't. I wasn't trying to, you know, blow smoke up here. But she, she was over there with him, I guess. She took a picture, and then she posted it. No name. There was no name Brian Salker or nothing on there. You know, it was just a picture of him shoveling. And you, just, you could just catch his face because he was, he was just throwing the, throwing the snow off. And I said to myself, that's exactly what we're looking at in the fire service. No, no coincidence that, that it's my son. Nothing to do with it. But the point is, those are the kind of people that we that, that number one we already do attract to the fire service. Those are the kind of people that show up, and and then we try and make them better. And then whatever environment you put them in, whatever the three or four or five guys that they're working with, you know. And and I tell guys sometimes they probably come up to you. They don't come up to me anymore because I'm a chief, or even when I was a captain, they might not. But uh, at a seminar, they might because we we develop a little bit better relationship with people. And a fireman or an officer might come up and you know at a seminar and ask or something. But you know, a guy, I'll say, "Gee, I'm really trying hard to be that guy that you guys are describing in class. I'm really trying hard to be, you know, really into the job and to to, you know, what any suggestions, any actual physical suggestions?" I said, "Yeah. If you find yourself sitting down in the kitchen for more than 10, 15 minutes, you're doing something wrong." You know, I said, "Most great guys that I worked with." I never found him in the kitchen. If I went to look for Willie Tracy, where did I find him? On the apparatus floor. If he wasn't in the kitchen, and I, to tell you the truth, I never looked in the kitchen for him. If he wasn't on the apparatus floor, he was at the workbench. If he wasn't at the workbench, sometimes he was in the tool room or out in the parking lot helping a guy jack his car up because he needed to change his starter because he couldn't get home or something like that. I said, that's the kind of stuff you want to do. Uh, you know, the other thing is don't, sh don't, don't tell anybody anything. You know, if, if, it, if it's a drill and somebody asks about something, you know, Obviously, answering a question is one thing, but show them, show people what you know. Don't, don't, don't tell them. You know, everybody's mouth is always running, and it, it, it's not the worst thing in the world. I'm not a big fan of people that talk a lot, but even even on football now, I watch football. You see every, you see half the players after every play, besides doing some kind of a crazy dance, they're all talking, 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 talking. They're all talking, talking to the referees, they're talking to each other. 
Years ago, you used to do the play, dust yourself off, go back to the line and wait for the huddle, you know? And the same thing in a fire department. Just limit the talking a little bit and, and, and maximize the doing. You know, if you find yourself walking around on the apparatus floor with nothing to do, I can guarantee you there's a couple of dirty compartments or a couple of dirty tools or a couple of tools that need another inch of fuel in, in the fuel tank, you know? So that that's how you get to be a great firefighter. That's how you get to be a well-respected guy that a gal that's into the job. Well, and, and I'm, I'm just going to throw something back on Brian real quick because, you know, your kids are my kids. You know what I'm saying? We're, we're, you know, in the other way around. I know that. You know, somebody said, so what's the big deal? He went and shoveled the sidewalk. You know what? I'm just going to say, you know, nobody's actually going to say that out loud. But if you're thinking that, you know, how do you not know that later on that day after it starts snowing? How do you not know that's the day that one of the widows, one of the family members, one of the children from one of those, you know, one of the members that are listed on that memorial, that's not the day that their hearts hurt a little bit and they just want to go visit that memorial and think about dad. You know, just, so 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 it was more than just shoveling the sidewalk. You know, it, it, you know, anybody can go shovel anybody's sidewalk. Uh, there, there's so much more meaning behind that when you talk about passion. And he, he is the most respectful. I don't know. Unassuming is the right word. It, you know, you know how we talk about some of your firehouses you've been in where I always say where legends were made. But if you if if you if you called Chief Kennedy a legend, I think he'd be very upset that you called him that. You know what I'm saying? The legends that are true legends do not right. want Most to be true called legends. legends. Re- avoid the titles and the, and the accolades. Yeah. Sure, that's right. And that's Brian. Brian's a hard ass worker. You don't hear him. He's one of those guys that shows you, doesn't talk his way through it. But so let's, let's go back in time. Forget he's your son. Young Brian Salka walks into the firehouse and he, he comes up to you. You know, like a month later, he's at a class. He's like. I'm on a great department, my great volunteer department, my great career department, and I want to train, I want to do stuff, but, you know, it's just me and one other guy that just are into the job. A couple of other guys, they're just not there. You know, if people have asked us this all the time. You know where I'm going with this. What, what do I do to – what do I do? These other guys, I'm not saying they're horrible people, but they'd rather be in there in a recliner on their phones doing stuff, and I want to, I want to go train or pull holes or do the tools. Me and my buddy, we want to do this stuff. What do you say to, to, to that young probie Brian Salka and his buddy that are, you know, they're by themselves in a firehouse that they want to do stuff, yet the other guys don't want to really engage? That's a tough one. And you and I both know that because we've, we've gotten that same inquiry, that same question from a lot of great young guys and gals. And the first one is it's unfortunate. You know, I was fortunate enough every place I went, there was always a line full of guys dying to get to me as the new guy, whether I transferred in or just got appointed there, you know, dying to show you stuff and dying to, you know, bring your skill level up. So that's that's a great environment to land in. And if you don't land in that, if you land in a place where the guys are friendly and, and cordial and, and nice and when drill time comes, they might show you one or two things, but they're not really into it. It's unfortunate because now you're sort of left to your own, you know, means of getting stuff done. And I've told guys, so listen, if it's you and another guy, Maybe a guy even went a couple of years and you ought to probably say, hey, Tommy, I don't know. I guess the lieutenant doesn't drill a lot around here or the captain. Nah, not really, you know, but uh, but if you want, yeah, you, you think you could show me something on the hearse tool or on the airbags or on the irons or the K tool or, you know, whatever it is. We can go on and on with 100 items, right? Sometimes you're going to have to train yourself or at least read up on your own and maybe maybe talk with another fellow firefighter. Maybe go hang out with a guy in the engine or the truck, whatever company you're in. Maybe there's a guy more into the job. You know, I tell guys, if you want to learn about the job, hang around the apparatus floor. You're going to find the guys like Willie Tracy out there eventually. They're going to walk out, and you and you just sort of walk over to them. I, I, hey, what, what you doing? Most guys are like, go, oh, go put your hands on, right? Yeah, look at this. Yeah. yeah, put your hands on something. You have a whole rig out there full with, with compartments full of open one up and start – put your hands on this and look at this and go, oh, so it's three turns to get that fog nozzle all the way dialed to straight stream mode. You know, it's three, one, two, three, straight stream, or it's this, or, you know, you know, we talk about putting your finger in the end to tell if you're in a fog pattern, you're a straight stream, if that's it, you know, is the bail working on the smooth bore, you know, just all those different things, looking at the handles, picking up, you know, it, some guys pick up an ax or halogen, and, and it's almost like the first time they've had them in their hands, you know, it's like every time you get in a rig with your gear and you put your air pack on, you get that much better at it. Same thing. You know what? And, and I got I've asked you to tell this story a hundred times. I'm going to ask you to tell it one more time. Polishing the brass. I, I got. Yeah. I can't move on from this topic and put your hands on stuff without talking about when you were probie, polishing that milk crate full of brass. Tell that story. Yeah, great story. 
So, so I'm a probie. And, uh, you know, there's, there's regular routines. Every firehouse has a beginning and a shift routine and a training routine and whatever. And uh, I forget what day of the week it is. Let's just call it Monday. On Mondays, whoever the junior man was, and if I was working, I was a junior man, right? Uh, you open up one of the rear compartments, the rear driver's side compartment, the old plastic milk box, you know, that people used to get their milk in, full of, you know, metal, a lot of brass fittings and, and everything else, reducers. And, and you, you have to take that box out, you know, away from the rig somewhere on the apparatus floor or wherever and take them all out. And, and there was a, uh, there was, a, there was a brass polish there, you know, went through clean rags and put the polish, smear it on all these two pieces. And then when they dry, by the time you put, you put the last piece with polish on it, the first one's ready to go. You get a clean, clean, you know, towel and start buffing them off, cleaning them up. And I'm telling you, those things shined like they were just made, like they were brand new. And it would take me a good hour to get this whole thing done, maybe longer, you know. And it was dozens and dozens of pieces, right? Little, little, whatever they were. And you pack them back all in there and put the box back in. And you were done for the day. You'd mention to the boss next time you saw him, hey, Cap, I took care of the fittings. Oh, oh thank you, John. And, uh, and I'm always saying to myself, gee, these things didn't really, they didn't really get dirty or, or start to fade a week later. A week later, I happen to be working Monday again. It's like, did you get the couplings yet? I'm like, I'm going to do it right now, Cap. And I'm saying to myself, <laughs> really? I did it seven days ago. They're still shiny. They're still shinier than anything else on the rig. Anyway, go down, do them again. So this went on, obviously, for a long time. And one day I was up in the office doing something, filling out a piece of paper for a day off or for a mutual or, or whatever it was. And the captain's at his desk on the phone talking to somebody. And he's like, yeah, oh, I have a whole box full on the rig just like you. Yeah. Oh, I have no idea. I, I have no idea. Oh, ho- hold on a second. Salka. Yeah, Cap. How many, how many, the fittings that you work on on Mondays? Do you know how many, yeah, what do you, what do you need to know? Like how, how many double females, how many double males? Oh, 12 of those, 11 of those. Do we have any, any gated Ys? Yeah, we have two gated Ys. Yep. Both inch and a half, no two and a half. And, and I recited the whole thing to him. And suddenly, it re- you know, as I was walking out of the office a minute later, I realized, you know what? That, that was the purpose. That was the purpose of that daily, what I thought, not daily, weekly, uh, useless exercise. The purpose was familiarization. And and who needs it more than a young guy that's, that's brand new? So you go through it, you put the wax on them, you take the polish off, and before you know it, you're looking at them and you're starting to mentally, even even unconsciously, count them and look at them and you know, put the same ones together over here and the same one. Wow, we got four of those, but only two of those, you know? And also, also you got to commit it to memory just from, yeah, that's muscle memory, just from doing it over and over. Great. A great little, not trick, but I thought it was a great little process. It's a great, it's a great mentoring leadership training story. I, I love you when you tell it. That's why I ask you to tell it so much. But and and think about that. It starts with the box, the milk crate full of fittings, and that spreads to the rest of the stuff that's in that compartment, and that spreads to this compartment, that compartment, this compartment, the hose bed under the driver's seat, the in the in the, in the glove compartments, whatever little cubbies you have, and before you know it. You know every inch of that pumper or ladder truck. You know every single inch of it. You're not running around opening up doors looking for shit at a call and all this stuff. You you own the rig. You own that rig. And then it spreads from the rig, right, to the floor. You know how many lengths of, of two and a half you had a hose rack. How many lengths of inch three quarter? You know where, where, where the repair kits are for things. <clears throat> you know where every single broom and mop is. You know where the, the polish is. You know where this is. You know where that is. You know where the furnace is. You know how to change the fill. All of a sudden, the whole freaking firehouse becomes yours. You know, like that like that milk crate full of fittings spreads to the rig, to the station, to everything. And that, and that's the purpose of, you know, the rigs being checked all the time. Obviously, in the FDMY, I'm retired now a couple of years, but right until the day I retired from the day I got there, the rig was checked every, every tour. I mean, you came in at 9 a.m., you checked the rig. If you were the Johnny or the Proby, and at six o'clock, if you continued on duty, if you were going to work another shift and do a twenty-four hour shift, you would check the rig again. Or if you went home, somebody else would check it. My point is, the rigs get checked that frequently, every single shift, every single day. There's no exceptions, you know. And then you and I, in our travel, sometimes that comes up in our class, and a guy come up to you at the break and say, "Really?" He said, "I thought we were doing pretty good in my company. We, you know, we, we check it like twice a week, like Monday morning the rig gets checked, and Thursday morning the rig gets checked." I thought. I thought that was pretty good. We weren't overdoing it. I said, 
That is pretty good. But is that what you want to be? Pretty good? Is that what you tell your kids? Oh, dad, you're a fireman. Yeah, I'm a pretty good fireman. Yeah, yeah. I said, what you want to do is you want to do it as much as you can because then everybody knows where everything is. Now you got this professional company. When somebody turns around and says, Billy, grab, grab the grab the smoothbore nozzle. He doesn't have to say it's in the compartment behind the wheel well. He doesn't have to say that because you turn and you go right to it. And you and I have seen the guys on YouTube and other videos where they roll up to a working fire and the guy is sort of sprinting around the rig, opening compartments and closing them. And, and he does it like three times before he comes up with like a nozzle or something pretty important. I'm saying he didn't know where that was, you know? So that's yeah, the same guy that walked great around. To get into. Well, that's a, the same guy that walks around the fire ground. Like you say, like he's at a picnic instead of with a bump in this stuff. Like we talked about the guys from Stockton working at a rapid pace, not running, but bam, 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 get off the rig with a purpose, what you're doing. This is goes back to know your assignments, know your tasks. But now there's two more people, John, that we can't pass by when it comes to influencing the passion in your firehouse. You know, are you into the job? Like we said, that the firefighters are into the job. And are you, that kind of thing. The, the next person, you mentioned him a little bit, Willie Tracy, the senior firefighter, the senior man, the senior guy or gal, and then the company officer. Here, here you talk about you talk about Pete Lund, talk about like certain rescue companies being impact companies like Wichita West. I can say this because I'm I'm so proud of them. We had another structure fire. The guys did great. Um, I always tell we want to be that impact fire department. When we show up with our fire department, we want to be things are gonna change when we get there. All right, same thing. Those company officers, John, and, and without without blowing smoke up your skirt, you were one. So let, you know. But the senior firefighter, like John Cullen, and I tell this story a lot in class, when, when Donnie Hayde set me up to ride 235 engine in Sal Marchese in Brooklyn, we went to 14 fires in 12 hours. Uh, Battalion 57, Chief Dennis Cross, you said acting deputy, kill 9-11. But, but John Cullen was lieutenant, one of your firefighters on squad one, right? And I, I always tell a story. It's 2.30 in the Johnny morning. Johnny squad. Sitting, Johnny squad. Uh, ended a job, man. And, and again, you know, busy – 14 fires in 12 hours, they're sitting in their bunker pants. I'm sorry. You know, I know we have different things now. But we're sitting around a kitchen table. It's 2.30 in the morning. I've told this story a thousand times. It's 2.30 in the morning. And he asked me to talk about, you know, they were asking me to talk about, like, the Denver rescue we came up with years ago. And he says, talk about that whole lover's knot thing, the Nance drill. They call it, the, you guys call it the lover's knot, but the handcuff knot, you know, the, the, the John Nance drill. In honor of John Nance from Columbus, who lost his life. And I, I'm, we're at the table tying, you know, tying the knot. And at 2.45, John, everybody gets up from the kitchen table, including Chief Cross and his aide. We walk out on the floor and we're hauling firefighters up through the fire pole hole. Chief Cross is standing there with his bunker pants on his white shirt, drinking a cup of coffee. What? I remember what he's watching this. You know how many grievances we filed out there, guys? We're training at 3 o'clock in the morning. Or I mean, it, that doesn't happen. When you don't have leaders like John Cullen, that doesn't happen when you don't have Willie Tracy. That doesn't happen when you don't have Mike Scotto. You know, I mean, uh, you, I go on and oh, the, you know, guys like that, that are just into the job. You know, they're, they're into it. You can't, I was talking about you, you know, you hang with people whose passion sets your soul on fire, you know, hang yep. with people love the job like you do. Cause if you hang with misery, misery loves what? Company, that's loves right. Company. Yeah, that's right, baby. That loves company. So, so you know, you know, we've talked about these people. Talk about, real quick. Talk about the impact the senior guy has on the motivation in the firehouse. You know, because you know that we talk about senior guys can get so much shit done, man. There's stuff. You're in your office doing your work, and they're taking care of all kinds of stuff in the rest of the fire that you don't even know about. Not illegal stuff, but they're they are managing things for you. The impact a good senior guy has, John, in one of your firehouses. Even though it's not official, most of them are sort of like a junior officer. They're like a sergeant, you know. They're, they're the they're the company officer's assistant, confidant. They help them out. They get stuff done for them. They they guide the firefighters on the apparatus floor. You know, if, if they're if they're straying a little bit or maybe not doing something exactly right, they're, they're you know energizing everybody. You know, like and I I talk about Willie Tracy when I was the captain. He was my subordinate. He was one of my firefighters, but he was a senior man. And boy, did he keep that place bopping everybody was always doing something matter of fact you know i'd walk in the kitchen and all of a sudden one of the truck guys would comment loud enough for me to hear deliberately he'd say uh-oh captain just walked in here and sees an engine guy sitting at the sitting at the kitchen table when willie tracy is out there washing the rig you know <laughs> and it just, just to say it 
just to say it. But it was so true. And, it, you know, Willie Tracy's my example, but I remember being a young firefighter and having the senior firefighters ahead of me, the guys that were senior to me. And, boy, did I love, you know, Richie Bardo was, was the senior man and the chauffeur of 11 Truck when I was a brand-new man there. I wasn't a probie, but I was close to it. And uh, I remember loving working with him. You know, he was a guy that had his own way of doing everything. And, you know, he knew where everybody was all the time. He always walked around a firehouse. I, another guy I never saw sitting down, right? And But, boy, did I learn a job from him. I had spent a year or more somewhere else before I got to 11 Truck where he was. And it was like a, it was like I wasted that year. It was like I had just joined the fire department and I was brand new again. And, and I'll never forget it. We're talking 40-something years ago. And I still remember it like like it was yesterday, you know. So, yeah, promoting that senior man thing is a good idea. And I've heard occasionally some people say, you know, your officers are in charge, not the senior fireman. And anybody who's anybody who's saying that is they're throwing, a, they're throwing away one of the most valuable assets in the firehouse, a senior guy that's doing it because he loves it. He's been doing it a long time. And he wants to, you know, he wants to help raise the level of, you know, competence and excellence in his own company. Well, and that whole passing of the torch thing, because it's, it's kind of when you look at you're the captain, lieutenant sitting there again, folks, <clears throat> your senior guy or gal doesn't have to have 30 years in a job. We know this. There's young fire departments out there where the senior firefighter has four years on your shift, you know, but they're the senior guy or gal. They're, you could tell them they're into the job. They, they, they look, smell, act, talk, breathe like they're, they're, that, that's who they are. And there's nothing, there's never been a prouder moment when, when the lieutenant would turn and say, Rick, and you, or you're already on it, or you're already sitting down going, hey, LT, just want to let you know, we got this, 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 and this done already. And he goes, appreciate that. And in his head, he's going, God, I, I didn't even I didn't even ask them yet to do that. He's already, right, we were talking about your go-to guys are always about 10 steps ahead of you when it comes to that, 10 steps ahead of, of getting stuff done. You know, those senior guys do an incredible, incredible job for you. Again, you don't have to have 30 years. Uh, be, 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 be that kind of, now, <clears throat> Lastly, talk about that 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 company officer that has their hand on the morale siren crank. You know, the one that we're talking about. Are you in the job as a firefighter? That can be easy, or that can be difficult, depending on who your boss is, man. You know, if you work for some slug of a boss, it it, it takes more energy to stay into the job when you get there working for a bad boss than it does to be into the you know. And when you have a bad day, it's even more difficult. You know, what does it take from that lieutenant or captain, John? to keep the guys motivated, to keep the, you know, to, to keep the guys excited about the job. You know, and it's the same thing. It's really just a carryover. It really has nothing to do with the fact that they're a company officer because those same guys were great senior firefighters. They were great motivational firefighters when they were firefighters. Then they made lieutenant, and then guys, you hear guys talking. Oh, you got that, you got that Lieutenant uh, uh, Brown? He's covering your battalion? Oh, hopefully your captain grabs him. Man, he was a dirty truck. What a home run that guy was. He was... He, he led the drills and everything else. I mean, he didn't take over the company job's job, but he, he you know, he did a great job there, and he's a lieutenant now. You're, you're not going to go wrong with him. So, you know, that, that positive attitude and that senior man attitude that a guy has as a firefighter, they carry that with them into being, into being a company officer. And after they settle in somewhere as the new boss, and, you know, take it slow because there's other bosses there already. They're going to fit in first, you know. Eventually, they're going to shine. And we talked about Bobby Morris and, you know, his boy, his son, and lots of other guys that we know, you know, Dennis Cross. And I, we could just go, you know, Tom Kennedy. We could go on and on and on. And Pete Lund, these are the guys that make the fire department what it is. These are, these are the people that, that make excellent companies and excellent battalions. And, and like I said before, it's not only contagious within the company or within the battalion, but sometimes there's another another waylaid engine company that's watching 45 saying, man, oh, man, Salka puts them to work every time, even ahead of sometimes somebody else. You know what I'm saying? Like, and, and sometimes guys start saying, hey, you guys want to be like fourth due for the rest of your lives? You guys want to be the last guys to take hose line up instead of stretching the line? Let's, let's get our shit together here, you know? So, so sometimes the contagious part is within the company and the guys that are around you, you know, their level comes up. But sometimes there's people somewhere else that are watching saying, Wow, they're doing something right that we're not doing because because we we never get picked for the, for the second line, you know, or, or however it is unfolding. So there's well, it, there it, are no it, negatives. It, there's only positives. Yeah, you hear me say it all the time. You know me. I'm a big Motown fan. Barry Gordy, who created Motown, one of the tenets from his success with Grow Motown was competition breeds champions. Absolutely, you know, I love that saying. Competition Absolutely. breeds champions. Just what you said. You're you're standing going. What does it take for us to be that good? Well. 
standing here doesn't, you know, training, passion, you know, and, and we'll, we'll finish to get a, finish things up here. But you've heard me say this a, a thousand times again. If you don't love what you do, you suck. You're not even very good. People who don't love how what they do suck. Be? How could you be? Right. Right. You, you know, especially the fire service, little boys and girls want to be you, man. This is the coolest thing in the world. Volunteer career. Be passionate. Love the job. John, I've been doing this for a long time and there's no end game here. There's no end. We're, we're still very active. We're still fighting fires. We're still doing stuff. We're still bringing, we're still training. We're still doing all this stuff. Um, because we love the job. And I didn't even think we love the job because of something in our upbringing, but we love the job because we were surrounded by other people. It was easy to glean That's that right. energy off of the Tommy Shervinos. Oh my God. The, the, the Bill Allens and the Jack and, uh, and each one of them had different mannerisms. Tommy Shervino was like, boom, 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 boom. And, and Eddie Enright was this calm. Things can be exploding and nothing shook the guy, you know? Um, so they all had different wavelengths, if you will, of, of of energy, but they were all into the job. So anyway, that's it, man. Be into the job. Love the job. You know, if you're, if you're having a tough time, <clears throat> if you're struggling, I, John and I have both been there. Find people that love the job like you do. In your department, neighbor's department, one of our classes, hang with people that love the job like you do. And and sometimes that'll help you. That's the that's the that's the 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 prescription, the medicine you need to get over that hump of for sure. negativity for sure. Or, or that. Hey, John, if they want to get a hold of you, best email. Chief John Salka at gmail.com. And I'm Chief Lasky at gmail.com. We, we thank you again for, for joining another one of our, uh, the command post, the command post uh, podcast of fireengineering.com. Um, obviously, unless you watch this on YouTube, just look at the header. I say this all the time at fireengineering.com. Everything you need is right there from fire fireengineer.com to gems to firefighter nation to fire all through there fdic everything's on there um there's no reason to not be in this incredible job um remember folks don't wait please don't wait i hate the disappointment guys say we couldn't get in your class same thing happened with three degrees of mayday john they had to shut the doors because we packed the room and yep. they do that folks at indy they they shut the doors and you're not allowed in when People are sitting on the floors around the tables and chairs. So sign up early. Make sure you hit us, Five Alarm Leadership, uh, our workshop on, on day one uh, in April at, at FDIC, and then the Three Degrees of May Day on Wednesday. Um, we hope to see you there. We ask you every time we do one of our shows, we always end it with, please keep the men and women our armed forces in your thoughts and prayers. And remember, never forgetting means just that, never forgetting. Thank you. God bless you. We'll see you next time. I'm out here. We got a fire. One and a half story, single family dwelling. Fire shown from the second floor. Give me a second alarm on this. I got people hanging out the top floor windows with a baby. Commercial building. Uh, a lot of fire, a lot of smoke. Go ahead and strike a third alarm on my orders on this. We got people on the front fire escape here with windows sunken below them. We need somebody up there. Yeah, let them know we got a job. I'm pulling up now. Second alarm, I got a one-story single-family frame. Heavy fire showing from the attic. So we're using all hands. We got one line stretch, fire on the fourth floor. Second line being stretched. Primary switches are underway. Like a trusted turnout jacket you've had for years, Flex 7 Outer Shell Fabric delivers a perfectly broken-in feel on the very first wear. Flexible, comfortable, and powered with the strength of enforced technology, Flex 7 Outer Shell Fabric is made to move. To learn more, visit tenkatafabrics.com slash flex7. Flex 7, powered by enforced technology. Only from Tenkata Protective Fabrics.